So good to be on with you. Praise be to God on this Tuesday, January the 3rd, 2023. Have you said that out loud yet? 2023? Seems crazy, doesn't it? Like, man, time flies. On the memorial of the most holy name of Jesus, praise be to God. Today, we're going to be talking about Benedict XVI quite a bit. Lord, I love you, his 
reported last words from Archbishop Gonswein. We're going to be talking about Benedict the Sixteenth and his legacy. Michael Hitchborn joins us at thirty or at fifteen past the hour, and then at thirty-five past the hour, Doctor Gavin Ashington is going to be on. He was the chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen before he became a Roman Catholic, actually. And we're going to be talking about not only Benedict the Sixteenth, how how his pontificate played a role in his life, but also about the fall of Christianity in England. Uh, and there's just so many stories. We, t- we touched on that last week. We're going to follow up on that today with Dr. Gavin Ashenden at 35 past the hour. Tons of stories in the news, of course. Big story breaking this morning as you wake up. I don't know if you're a big football fan or a Buffalo Bills fan, but uh, the Damar Hamlin uh, story is pretty big today. He collapsed after a tackle on the field in the first, uh, I think it was the first inning, uh, or at least in the first quarter, and he fell over right after, suffering a cardiac event. He had a pulse, but uh, was not breathing. He was revived. He's in critical condition as of right now. Pray for him. But uh, this is just one of in countless stories we're reading about of uh, star athletes falling over just suddenly like that. Let's pray for him. Uh, guess what? Uh, President, Vice President Kamala Harris is requiring a uh, zero COVID test in order to have pictures taken with her today as members of Congress are sworn in. Very interesting. A 19-year-old accused of attacking three New York Police Department officers on uh, on New Year's. Apparently, was radicalized online. An Islamic a terrorist attack there. Did you even hear about that story? I found that to be underreported for some odd reason. Avenger actor Jeremy Renner is in a critical condition. Apparently, he had a snowblower accident. I didn't realize actors snowblowed their own driveways and walkways. Um, pray for him. Apparently, it, it, the blades like chopped him up or something. Uh, it sounds terrible. Uh, but he is in critical condition now. And then uh, uh, apparently there's a national park in the Florida Keys. The Dry Tortugas National Park shut down after 300 migrants from Cuba showed up. They're like, close the border. We're done here. <laughs> Only 300. Huh. It's been, what, a million in 2022 on the southern border? But it's still wide open. No well, shutting that down. Florida takes it a little more serious now. Speaking of shutting things down, um, we were shut down while you were left. Really? really? I mean, welcome back. Oh, I mean, it's good to be back. Was you were, were you relaxed? I mean, did oh, you enjoy your vacation am, while Adrian and I slaved away over here? I'm my heart is so full. Really? You know? uh, it was. It, I was. Mm-hmm. I mentioned it before we got on air. It was mm-hmm. the, the first real vacation I've ever taken in my entire life. Oh, I see. So it was fantastic, and you had, had a great time. And your real vacation you spent in California. <laughs> Sounds. <laughs> Sounds brilliant. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Well, you got to have a vacation from the vacation. I see. Step so on a, can, a heroin needle or anything? It, you know? <laughs> a heroin <laughs> needle? No. Okay, no, there weren't bad. any of those. <laughs> well, praise be to God. Yeah. Well, uh, anyway. I was in the good part of town. Uh-huh. How was uh, New Year's? Anybody do anything interesting? Mm-hmm. Fell asleep? Nah. Yeah. Not really. <laughs> I woke up to a war zone. <laughs> so many war zone. Man, Houston takes the cake, man. Houston. Whew. It is. Uh, people were probably intense. shooting off guns as well. It was a Let's continuous two hours. It wasn't like, here's a firework here, firework. Yeah. It was continuous firework popping for two yeah. hours. Normally, we pop a lot of fireworks for yeah. New Year's, but mm-hmm. it was pretty tame this year because half of our family was off doing other things. We had cousins with uh, significant others and siblings at other things. So it was pretty quiet at home. And the cost of fireworks, you know, inflation, you know, very, very expensive. <laughs> we're okay with that. I we'll we'll spend the money on fireworks. <laughs> I don't see we'll, the we'll, point. We'll, we'll blow off a ton of money on that. I just don't see the point of buying fireworks when you could just sit and watch the neighbors. Let them spend the money. No, I lighting, get all the show. Lighting them up is part is half the fun. No. Lighting them up is half the fun. <laughs> Saving the money is half the fun. No, no. But you know what? You know what? Today is one of my favorite days of the year. Mm, really? It's the feast of the holy name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And that's God. like one of my favorite uh, feasts. I, I have a huge devotion to the mm-hmm. holy name. Amen. Well, hey, before we jump in real quick, let me remind you, we have launched our 2023 car raffle campaign. You, too, could win a beautiful Mercedes. Just ask Clarissa. She she won it last time. She, you know, guess she can awesome. win again, have a whole garage full of, of uh, Mercedes. But nonetheless, some lucky Catholic Radio listener is going to drive away in a brand new 2023 CLA 250 in polar white. Get your tickets online at grnonline.com. 25 apiece, or you can get five for 100. Great way to support Catholic Radio across the GRN. But nonetheless, let's pray. Let's begin. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, remember, 
O most gracious Virgin Mary, that never was it known, that anyone who fled to thy protection, implored thy help, or sought thine intercession was left unaided. Inspired by this confidence, I fly unto thee, O Virgin of virgins, my mother. To thee do I come, before thee I stand, sinful and sorrowful. O Mother of the Word incarnate, despise not my petitions, but in thy mercy hear and answer me. Amen. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. And now your headlines with Rudy Carlos. Good morning. Thanks for tuning in to Catholic Drive Time. Today is Tuesday, January the 3rd, and here are your headlines this morning. By the way, it's good to be back in the saddle again. Catholic News Agency reports Benedict XVI to be buried in first tomb of Pope John Paul II. The former Pope's death at age 95 was announced in Rome on December the 31st. Benedict the Sixteenth Benedict the Sixteenth's coffin will be carried to the crypt under the central part of St. Peter's Basilica for interment after his funeral mass on January 5th. St. John the Twenty-Third was also previously buried in the same place, which is fewer than 100 feet from the tomb of St. Peter the Apostle, the first pope. May he and the souls of the faithful departed rest in peace. Ground News reports J.P. Morgan and Deutsche Bank seek dismissal of lawsuits by Jeffrey Epstein accusers. Deutsche Bank and J.P. Morgan Chase are asking a federal court to throw out lawsuits that claim the big banks should have seen evidence of sex trafficking by Jeffrey Epstein, the high-flying financier who died under mysterious circumstances in jail while facing criminal charges. The Washington Times reports January 6 committee shutting down after refer referring Trump for crimes. The House January 6 committee is shutting down after a colossal waste of taxpayer money investigating the 2021 Capitol protest. The committee sent its work to the Justice Department along with a recommendation for prosecuting former President Donald Trump. Some of the committee's work, such as videotape of hundreds of witnesses' interviews, will not be made public immediately. And the Washington Examiner reports New York makes human composting after death legal. Human composting is a process of burial that has the deceased put into a container with plants to allow the body to decompose and become part of the nutrient-rich soil. The method is seen as a greener, and some would say a soylent greener way, for burial rather than appropriate methods like interment. The bill has received pushback from some groups, including the New York State Catholic Conference, who said, quote, Human bodies are not household waste, and we do not believe that the process meets the standard of reverent treatment of our earthly remains, unquote. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. The saint of the day is Saint Genevieve. She was described as a peasant girl born on Natara to Cerverus and Gronosia. On his way to Britain, Germanus of Oxer stopped at Nantera and Genevieve confided to him that she wanted to live only for God. He encouraged her and at the age of 15, Genevieve became a consecrated virgin. On the deaths of her parents, she went to live with her godmother, Lutetia, in Paris. There, were, there the young woman became admired for her piety and devotion to works of charity and practiced fasting and the mortification of the flesh, which included abstaining from meat and breaking her fast only twice in the week. These mortifications she continued for over 30 years till her ecclesiastical superiors thought it their duty to make her diminish her austerities. She encountered opposition and criticism for her activities both before and after she was again visited by Germanus from those who were jealous or considered her an imposter or hypocrite. Genevieve had frequent visions of heavenly saints and angels. She reported her visions and prophecies until her enemies conspired to drown her in a lake. Through the intervention of Germanus, their animosity was finally overcome. The Bishop of Paris appointed her to look after the welfare of the other consecrated virgins, and by her instruction and example, she led them to a high degree of sanctity. Shortly before the attack of the Huns under Attila in 451 on Paris, Genevieve and Germanus Archdeacon persuaded the panic-stricken people of Paris not to flee, but to pray. It is claimed that the intercession of Genevieve's prayer caused Attila's army to go to Orleans instead, during Childeric's siege and blockage of Paris in 464, Genevieve passed through the siege lines in a boat to Troyes, bringing grain to the city. 
She also pleaded to the Childerics for the welfare of the prisoners of war and met with a favorable response. Through the influence, Childeric and Clovis displayed unwanted clemency toward the citizens. Genevieve cherished a particular devotion to St. Denis and wished to erect a chapel to, in his honor to house his relics. Around 475, Genevieve purchased some land at the site of his burial and exhorted the neighboring priests to use their utmost endeavors. When they replied that they had no lime, she sent them to the bridge of Paris where they learned the whereabouts of large quantities of this material for the conversation of two swineherds. After this, the building proceeded successfully. The small chapel became a famous place of pilgrimage during the 5th and 6th centuries. Sometimes Genevieve is also depicted with the devil who is said to have blown out the candle when she went to pray in the church at night. She died in 512. Saint Genevieve, pray for us. Praise be to God in all things. The gospel today comes to us from Luke chapter 2, verses 21 through 24. This is the optional gospel today. When eight days were completed for his circumcision, the child was named Jesus, the name given him by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. When the days were completed for their purification, according to the law of Moses, they took him up to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, just as it is written in the law of the Lord. Every male that opens the womb shall be consecrated to the Lord and to offer the sacrifice of a pair of turtle doves and two young pigeons in accordance with the dictate in the law of the Lord. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. Cornelius Salapide said, So in his circumcision, Christ humbled himself to a still greater degree than in his nativity. In the latter, he took upon him the form of a man. In the former, the character of a sinner. Close quote, Cornelius Salapide. The Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture, also a very good commentary, by the way, really recommended. It says, as the firstborn, uh, firstborn, Jesus is God's property, consecrated to God as a sacrifice. Parents could redeem, in other words, buy back such a child from God at the price of five shekels of silver. Luke makes no reference to this part of the ceremony, but indicates that instead of the lamb prescribed to be offered as a sacrifice by the mother, Mary offers what was known as the poor woman's offering. Close quote, a Catholic commentary on Holy Scripture. Haydock's commentary points out, and also did Cornelius Lapide, by the way, uh, saying that there are many reasons that may be alleged why our Savior submitted to the painful and humbling knife of circumcision. Number one, to manifest the whole world, or manifest to the whole world, the reality of his human nature and the difference between his divinity and humanity. Number two, to show he approved of circumcision, which he had instituted. Number three, to prove that he was the seed of Abraham. Number four, to teach us humility and obedience by observing a law to which he was not bound. Number five, that by receiving the burden of the law, he might free those who were under the law. And lastly, that the Jews might have no excuse for rejecting him because he was uncircumcised. Close quote. Haydock's commentary. In fact, Cornelius goes on to quote Thomas Aquinas, Augustine, and others on similar reasons. So it's fascinating because our Lord leads the way. You know, he leads the way from the front and not the rear. And he, he takes upon himself the burden of the law fulfills it completely, which includes the fact that he should be nailed to a tree, according to the prescription of the law of Moses, that he would be whipped and have the stripes that would bear the sins of all, the crown of thorns, and so much more. This is foreshadowing, foreshadowing of something greater to come, and that would be the sacrament of baptism. Hey, we'll be right back. We're going to talk about the legacy of Benedict XVI that's coming up next. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. G.K. Chesterton says that it is in the old Christmas carols that date from the Middle Ages that we find not only what makes Christmas poetic and soothing and stately, but what makes it exciting. The exciting quality of Christmas rests upon a great paradox that the power and center of the whole universe may be found in something very small, a baby in a manger. And it's extraordinary to notice how completely this paradox of the manger 
was lost by the brilliant theologians, but was kept in the Christmas carols. The songs recall the main point of the story, that God once ruled the universe from a stable, and that the hands that made the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. For victory in life, we've got to keep focused on the goal, and the goal is heaven. The key to winning is choosing to do God's will and love others with all you've got. Sacrifice, discipline, and prayer are essential. We gain strength through God's Word, and we receive grace from the sacraments. And when we fumble due to sin, and it's going to happen, confession puts us back on the field. So if you haven't been going to Mass Weekly, get back in the game. We're saving your seat on the starting bench this Sunday. Welcome home. Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time. Keeping you informed and inspired, I'm your host, Joe McLean. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Dr. Gavin Ashenden is going to be our guest at 35 past the hour. Former Anglican bishop, former chaplain to Her Majesty the Queen of England, is going to be on to talk about the dictatorship of relativism that his country is facing right now. I mean, ours too, of course, but... It'll be fascinating to get his take on that, plus uh, what uh, the legacy was in his perspective of Benedict XVI, all of that coming up at 35 past the, the hour. Of course, uh, you know, we, we knew going into the New Year's weekend uh, that we were all expecting Benedict XVI to pass. His, his situation was degenerating pretty quickly with kidney failure. That's usually the sign of the end. The good news is he had an opportunity to prepare himself well for that. You know, he saw it coming. What a grace that is. How many do not have that. I mean, uh, we're looking at this Buffalo Bills player who collapsed. You know how many athletes collapsed in the last two years suddenly and died instantly with no opportunity to see it coming, to to prepare themselves, to make a good and holy confession, receive last rites, to be ready to meet the just judge, as Benedict XVI called him in his February 2022 letter in regards to the uh, sex abuse scandal in the Diocese of Munich, which he was bishop of back in 1980. So, what a grace. Praise be to God. He was able to prepare. In fact, we are told by Archbishop Gonswine, his last words were, Jesus, I love you. <sighs> you couldn't ask for much more than that. I mean, really, that is that is an amazing thing. So, uh, we are praying for the repose of the soul of Benedict XVI. But I have to say, when, when, when I think back on the legacy of Benedict XVI, I remember uh, him being elected, coming out onto the, the balcony. I was supposed to be standing there, as a matter of fact. I had uh, been given a wonderful opportunity from a, uh, a person I worked for at the time, who I was having great conversations with about the Catholic faith. And when uh, JP2 died, he came down and he said, listen, I want to send you to Rome. I want you to be there in the, in the uh, St. Peter's Square when they make the announcement, when you see the smoke rising, I want you to be there and experience that. The only thing that did uh, stop me from going was the fact that my wife was pregnant and she and it probably was not husband of the year material to leave a pregnant wife behind while you're while you're in St. Peter's Basilica, you know, square or whatever. So gallivanting. Oh, gallivanting, yeah. So I we, we put it off and we went we went when my daughter was born, she was three months old, and we jumped on a plane. He was so gracious, my boss at the time, to allow me to continue to uh, to take him up on that offer. So we were able to go for seven days. And it was an amazing experience. We went to the tomb of JP2, which was where Benedict XVI will be reposed after his funeral this Thursday. And uh, we spent a lot of time with the bones of St. Peter. And uh, we went to Holy Mass on December the 8th, 2005, with Benedict XVI. And I got to stand probably 15 or 20, I guess it was probably like 20, 25 feet from him. And uh, the red shoes stood out to me. And I thought, this guy's shorter than I really expected him to. I thought he was taller. He's a short guy with the coolest red shoes you've ever seen in your life. Uh, and then my daughter, uh, three months old, was blessed by him. So it was an amazing experience to be sure. But the, the lasting legacy, when I think about the legacy, a lot of people are going to think, well, he's, he's among the last to attend Second Vatican Council. He was considered liberal at the time. He became more conservative later. Was he a defender of tradition? Well, uh, some would say yes. His... his uh, his Sumorum Pontificum provided for a greater use of the traditional Latin Mass. We find out now, uh, it, after his passing, that in fact, when uh, Pope Francis wrote his Traditionis Custodis, Benedict XVI wrote a letter to the Fraternity of St. Peter uh, trying to encourage them in this difficult time. 
So it, there's a lot of things you could say or speak to about his lasting legacy. But for me, it was his stepping down. It was his resignation. I was, uh, I was very discouraged by that, to be honest with you. I, saw, I see an article here. Out of CNA, it says, in stepping down, Benedict XVI carved out a new role as contemplative pope. This led to great confusion, in my opinion. The article says, and I'm sharing my desktop, it says, on February 11, 2013, before gathering of cardinals who had come to the Vatican expecting to hear the announcement of upcoming canonizations, Pope Benedict XVI dropped a bombshell. After a few announcements about church business at the conclusion of the meeting, the Pope took out two sheets of paper and read a prepared statement in Latin. I have convoked you to this consistory not only for the three canonizations, but also to communicate to you a decision of great importance for the life of the church. After having repeatedly examined my conscience before God, I have come to the certainty that my strengths due to my advanced age are no longer suited to adequate exercise of the Petrine ministry. Then the 85-year-old pontiff told the gathering of the Catholic Church's highest-ranking clergyman. Because he spoke in Latin, the language used for official Vatican proclamations, reporters present did not at first realize that the Pope had just stepped down. The assembled cardinals, on the other hand, who knew their Latin, reacted with stunned silence. American Cardinal James Stafford later told CNA that the Pope's statement was received with total surprise, total shock. Quote, a cardinal who was sitting next to me said, did he resign? I said, yes, that's what he did. He resigned. And we just all stood at our places. Nigeria's Cardinal Francis Arinze, who was present that morning, said the announcement was a surprise like thunder that gives no notice that it's coming, reported the Catholic Telegraph. In renouncing the papacy, Benedict became only the second pope in almost 600 years to voluntarily step down. In 1294, Pietro de Morone, an elderly hermit, was crowned Pope Celestine V, but finding the demands of the job too much for him, he resigned after only five months. In 1415, Pope Gregory the the 11th, or 12th rather, Pope Gregory the 12th, also resigned, but under very different circumstances. He stepped down in order to end a crisis within the church known as the Great Western Schism. What happened next with Benedict XVI was no, with, was no less surprising to those who expected him to live as he retired cardinal live as a retired cardinal. In his last official statement as Pope, before a general audience on February the 27th, 2013, Pope Benedict assured the tens of thousands of people gathered to hear him speak as Pope for the last time that, that even though he was stepping back from official duties, he would remain, in essence, Pope. Let that sink in for a second. This is where it becomes very confusing. Quote, going on to say, quote, the always is also a forever. There can no longer be a return to the private sphere. My decision to resign the active exercise of the ministry does not revoke this. Close quote, Benedict said, going on to say, quote, I do not return to private life, to a life of travel, meetings, receptions, conferences, and so on. I am not abandoning the cross, but remaining in a new way at the side of the crucified Lord. Close quote, he told the crowd. A day earlier, on February the 26th, 2013, the director of the Vatican Press Office, Father Federico Lombardi, has silenced speculation over what Benedict would be called and what he would wear. He would, Lombardi said, retain the trappings of the papacy, most significantly his title and dress. Quote, he was, he will still be called His Holiness Benedict the 16th, Lombardi said, but he will also be called Pope Emeritus or Roman Pontiff Emeritus. Lombardi said Benedict would continue to wear a white cassock, but without the mozetta, the short cape that covers the shoulders. The Pope's fisherman's ring would be replaced by a ring from his time as cardinal. The red shoes would go as well, Lombardi said, and be replaced by a pair of brown ones. The city of Lyon is known for beautiful shoes and very comfortable shoes. And when the Pope was asked what he wanted to wear, he said, I want the shoes from Leon in Mexico, Lombardi said at a press conference. On May the 2nd, the Cardinal was uh, was, uh, designated 
Let me start over. On May the 2nd, the Cardinal, who designed Benedict's coat of arms in 2005, told CNA that he had written the Pope's emeritus, suggesting that his coat of arms would need to be redesigned to reflect his new status. Cardinal Andrea uh, Cordero Lanza di Montezomolo proposed making the keys of St. Peter smaller and less prominent. That shows that he had a historic possession, but not a current jurisdiction, the cardinal said. Benedict, however, it seems, politely declined a new coat of arms. La Stampa reported the following year that the Vatican Publishing House's Manual of Ecclesiastical Heraldry in the Catholic Church contained the following note. Expressing deep appreciation and heartfelt gratitude to the author for the interesting study sent to him, Benedict made it known that he prefers not to adopt an expressive heraldic emblem of the new situation created with his renouncing the Petrine ministry. By his decision to continue to dress in white like the Pope, retain the title of Pope, and keep the coat of arms of his papacy, Benedict revealed that in giving up the active exercise of the ministry, he was not forsaking the role of Pope altogether. Do you see where the, the confusion is here? We've created something new, this office of contemplative Pope. He didn't see himself leaving the papacy. Now, don't get me wrong. I, pope Francis is the pope. He is the guy in charge. He has jurisdiction. He has governmental power. There's no question. But it was always confusing to see Benedict XVI there. I felt like if he was going to step down and retire, he needed to fully step down. I felt like he needed to move off, go off to Germany, uh, wear red like a cardinal. If you want to live contemplative, live contemplative there. But to retain the title, to retain the dress, to retain a, a, a symbol, a symbolic ring there living in the Vatican, to have guests and people uh, coming to him. In fact, this article goes on to talk about how uh, that was the case. This is in his 2013 announcement. Benedict clearly expressed his intention to step aside, even determining a date and time of his official departure. Nonetheless, his decision to keep the title of Pope and maintain ceremonial protocol that goes along with the papacy led some to speculate whether or not there were actually two popes. So very confusing to the point even where Francis himself in this article, which you can read fully at Catholic News Agency's website, catholicnewsagency.com, even Pope Francis himself says, listen, if I retire, and he's already signed his retirement letter, by the way, he, he already, we learned that a week and a half ago, that he had submitted a letter of resignation, signed, and just put away just in case his health should decline. It's already ready to go. They just got to pull it out and, I guess, implement it. But if he should ever have to retire, he will, he will retire to St. John Lateran, not St. Peter's, not the Vatican, but St. John Lateran, which is uh, at another location. And he would retain the title of the uh, Bishop Emeritus of Rome, not Pope Emeritus. So I think even His Holiness Pope Francis recognizes that there's a confusion here that I don't think was all that helpful for Holy Mother Church. I mean, he, he, he could have easily prayed and offered a life of prayer for Holy Mother Church in Germany, St. John Lateran, uh, Castel Gandolfo. I mean, there are many options he could have chosen, but to stay at the Vatican, to retain the look and the feel of the papacy, I think led to greater confusion. And I think that will be among his greatest legacy. I wonder what you think. You can always join us in conversating about this on our live video feeds, which you can find linked up on our website at grnonline.com forward slash CDT. But coming up after the break, more breaking news and stories with Rudy Carlos and the Dr. Gavin Ashington will give us his thoughts on the legacy of Benedict XVI. All of that and much more is coming up next. Don't go anywhere. Catholic Drive Time. I'll be right back. Our family has spanned the centuries and the globe. With God's grace, we started hospitals to care for the sick. We established orphanages and helped the poor. We are the largest charitable organization on the planet, bringing comfort to those in need. 
We educate more children than any other institution. We developed the scientific method and founded the college system. We defend the dignity of human life and uphold marriage. Guided by the Holy Spirit, we compiled the Bible. We are transformed by sacred scripture and sacred tradition, which have guided us for 2,000 years. We are the Catholic Church. With over one billion in our family, sharing in the sacraments and fullness of the Christian faith, Jesus started our church when he said to Peter, the first pope, you are rock, and upon this rock I will build my church. So if you've been away from the Catholic Church, we invite you to take another look. Visit catholicscomehome.org today. We are Catholic. Welcome home. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking. We're currently cruising at 39,000 feet. We'll turn that seatbelt sign off for you and let you move about the cabin. Looks like we'll have you at the gate in plenty of time for you to get to confession before Mass this evening. Wouldn't it be great if everyone regularly went to confession? Why not start today? A friendly suggestion from Guadalupe Radio Network. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm Rudy Carlos. I'm back. Today is Tuesday, January the 3rd, and now here's more headlines. Just the news reports, TSA spends $18.6 million on security screening for gender-neutral passengers. The Federal Spending Watchdog Group, OpenTheBooks.com, reported on the new security screening that will be rolled out starting this month. The funding for the non-gender imaging technology will be appropriated from funds inside the omnibus spending legislation that President Joe Biden just signed. The TSA receives approximately 26,542 screening complaints annually, with slightly over 6% from members of the so-called LGBTQ community. LifeSite News reports, providential support. FSSP releases statement following death of Pope Benedict XVI. The priestly fraternity of St. Peter have stated that the late Pope Benedict sent them a letter encouraging the superior of the, of the traditional community after Pope Francis issued Traditionis Custodis, which suppressed the traditional Latin Mass. Such an action of the part of the now deceased Emeritus Pontiff marks a very rare intervention since he began his life of retirement on February 28, 2013. May he rest in peace. And those were your headline news this morning. God love you. Praise be to God in all things. Thank you, Rudy, for keeping us up to date. Joining us now via Zoom chat is Dr. Gavin Ashenton. He is a uh, Catholic layman, uh, author, commentator, associate editor of the Catholic Herald, formerly a priest of the Church of England and subsequently continuing Anglican bishop. He was appointed chaplain to the Queen in 2008 until his resignation in 2017. And good morning to you, Dr. Ashenton. Hello, Joe. Good morning to you and everyone listening. Thank you for your time today. We're very grateful to you. Happy New Year. Merry Christmas to you. Uh, let's start with Benedict XVI. Uh, you know, I, I imagine that his passing has uh, some effect upon you. I was just thinking about uh, Benedict XVI visiting the UK in 2010, and a good friend of mine who was a priest uh, and was stationed in the UK at the time, he expressed it like a, almost like a, a Catholic nuclear bomb going off there. What was your experience like as someone coming from Anglicanism into the Catholic faith in regards to Benedict XVI? And what do you think is his legacy? Well, I've been doing a podcast for the Catholic Herald today with a, a, a friend of mine who used to be an Anglican bishop and is now a Monsignor in the Ordinariat. And he was saying, effectively, Benedict was our father. We've lost a father in this. His vision was so generous and so astute that he made he made it possible for Anglicans who were perched in their own minds halfway between the Reformation and the Catholic Church to find refuge as their own church began to sink under the waves of, of secular and progressive ideology. So we owe him an enormous amount, um, both for those who joined the Ordinariat and for those who were so inspired by his his prophetic witness to Catholic and Christian truth that they wanted to take refuge in the Catholic Church uh, and, and find a place there. So the answer is he's been immensely important to us and we mourn his, his going deeply. So do you think he'll have a, a positive legacy amongst uh, English Catholics? Yes, when he came to England, there was a great deal of opposition and people trying to whip up some of the old shibboleths from the Reformation. Um, and and, and not, nasty things were said about his childhood, which were entirely without substance uh, as a way to blacken him. But when he arrived, 
Um, it was it was as if because the press had painted such an unpleasant picture of him, mm. the reality of who Joseph Ratzinger was as Pope Benedict was so attractive and so welcoming that, that people's hearts melted uh, and all the opposition, which was predicated on a false image of him, disappeared. Um, he had, a, he had a, a very powerful effect indeed. And I, for many of us, when we suddenly saw the Catholic Pope sitting in Westminster Abbey, named St. Peter's, built by Catholics, for Catholics, um, <clears throat> marking the thousand years of Catholic Christianity in England, it was it was the most wonderful moment, and we hoped it was a prophetic moment for the restitution of 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 Catholic buildings to the Catholic Church, and indeed the English people to the Catholic Church. So, yeah. uh, whatever comes of that, the symbolism was very powerful. In his homily right before he was elected as Benedict the Sixteenth, he talked about the dictatorship of relativism, which I think would be a uh, a statement we will probably remember in regards to Benedict the Sixteenth. Uh, for a very long time in the church, because that seems to be exactly what we're facing in the world today. In fact, in England, I saw over the weekend uh, a story out of the Daily Mail that talked about a uh, an Anglican priest who is now officially a transvestite, somebody who is supposedly non-binary. I mean, we seem to be accepting things uh, that are completely at odds with what we believe as Christians. And in England, it's is it has the ship sailed? I mean, are we beyond the point of return at this point? What say you, Dr. Gavin Agenden? Well, if you're not optimistic and positive-minded, pe people feel uncomfortable because they think it's probably a duty on us all to see the best uh, of things. But the trouble is, if, if you're in the middle of a disaster and you need a way out of a building that's on fire or you need a lifeboat for a ship that's sinking, it's not kind to, to tell the truth about the situation. Um, the residual, the the, 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 Christ, the Church of England has given way completely to the zeitgeist. And one of Benedict's other great gifts was to constantly invite the church to be aware of the distinction between the zeitgeist and the Holy Spirit, the contrary spirit, the disturbing spirit and the Holy Spirit. This is something that on the whole, very few people seem equipped or even willing to do. And the problem is that because sex has become a new form of deity for people, a mixture of sex and also a kind of Jungian self-authentification, the combination of those two ideas seems to have replaced salvation uh, in, in some people's minds entirely. And this poor, this poor English clergyman person is, is the latest example of someone who's been desperately confused and, and clearly has no experience of the real God at all, but is is terribly open to the um, the disturbances of his own psyche and, and the zeitgeist. And, and there's no one there to rescue him. The church simply tells him he's doing a good thing. So we're very grateful for, for, for Benedict's clarity and above all, his invitation to exercise the gift of discernment, which Christians have, from St. Paul onwards, have always known was one of the most important tools we have in our armory in order to, to keep us close to Jesus and make us suspicious of the world where it stands against God and his purposes. You know, there was a lot of stories I, I want to get your comment on. After the break, we're going to be hitting a break here in just a few minutes. And uh, after that, I want to talk about the King's speech. But uh, you also wrote an article called Christmas is an Antidote to Our Pampered Egotistical Culture. I thought that was very good, especially like there was some of these other stories. It just feels like England in, in particular. I mean, America's not really an exception to this. But in England, you had this uh, lady who was arrested just recently for silently praying. You have uh, you have uh, per street preachers that constantly get uh, arrested or, or harassed. It seems like in England, Islam and uh, atheism get more, more attention, more of a pass, more toleration than Christianity does. So uh, I just keep going back to this idea that these Christian peoples who seemingly have just given everything over to, to the world, the flesh and the devil, uh, is England really a true atheistic country or agnostic at best? Or how would we describe that now? Yeah, I'm. I'm sorry to say, I think I think it's pretty well gone. Uh, I became a Christian in 1975. I was a law student, and uh, I became an evangelical Anglican, uh, and then slowly found my way towards the Catholic Church over the years. But uh, England has gone not not because people like me haven't done our very best to witness to the gospel. Uh, we we really have. We've we've preached and prayed and evangelized our hearts out, but. 
we were facing something, I think, cosmically much bigger. Uh, and so in England at the moment, we have three, if you like, three figures. We have we have, we have Muhammad, uh, we have Jesus, and we have Karl Marx. And, and they're, they're three communities. And the problem is that that Karl Marx, as, as in as in progressive wokeism, uh, the 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 vicious left, has set about trying to destroy Christianity in a way that's been going on for a hundred years, and and in the corner sits Muhammad, and and the followers of Karl Marx think that they will overcome Muhammad in the same way they can overcome the followers of Jesus, because they they think of Islam as a kind of Arabic form of Judeo Christianity instead of a much more sophisticated. Uh, mixture of politics and religion, which, which it is. And so, the, but, but meanwhile, the, the Muslims sit very quietly as they watch the church being destroyed because effectively the secularists are doing their job for them. Uh, and then I think probably in the next 10 years, Christianity will take a very severe beating at the hands of the total, increasingly totalitarian left. And then after 2030, there'll be a confrontation as already is in Paris and in France and other parts of Europe between Islam and the secular state. Uh, my my money's on Islam, but but who knows? But the tragedy in the moment is that Christians, instead of seeing what the next 10, 20 or 30 years are going to involve in the death of, of Europe, and I'm afraid I think, I think America is not very far behind in terms of the way in which this is playing out. Instead of seeing that we're fighting not only for our for, for our freedom, for our lives, above all for freedom of conscience, and for this this very very precious culture that Christendom created, which has allowed humanity to reach some of the heights of artistic and aesthetic, cultural and spiritual beauty, it it's it's we're we're back to the fifth century. Well, it's much worse than when the Vandals were at the gates with Augustine, because these Vandals are truly terrifying totalitarian brutes. Uh, and and the, uh, my my complaint is that the Christians are giving up too easily in Europe. We should be we should be fighting to, to, to fighting not necessarily physically, but intellectually, spiritually, and morally, we should be, we should really uh, using all our energies to avoid going down, partly because we owe it to Jesus and partly because mm. we owe it to our ancestors, our forefathers, our, above all our Christian forefathers, some of whom gave their lives for the faith. So there's this yeah. apathy and this blindness in the church. And I'm afraid I think I hold our bishops partly accountable for this. Amen. Because it's there, they, they have been tough. Hold that thought right there. Dr. Gavin Ashenden's our guest. Real quick break. For the network, we're going to be right back. More to come. Are you looking for peace? Longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into a suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to LordTeachMeToPray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to LordTeachMeToPray.com and click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. G.K. Chesterton says that it is in the old Christmas carols that date from the Middle Ages that we find not only what makes Christmas poetic and soothing and stately, but what makes it exciting. The exciting quality of Christmas rests upon a great paradox that the power and center of the whole universe may be found in something very small, a baby in a manger. And it's extraordinary to notice how completely this paradox of the manger was lost by the brilliant theologians, but was kept in the Christmas carols. The songs recall the main point of the story, that God once ruled the universe from a stable, and that the hands that made the stars were too small to reach the huge heads of the cattle. Want more than a minute? Chesterton.org. Praise be to Jesus Christ, especially on this uh, feast day of the holy name of Jesus. Uh, joining us again is Dr. Gavin Ashenden, former Anglican bishop, Catholic layman author, and uh, associate editor at the Catholic Herald. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year again to you, Dr. Gavin Ashenden. Thank you for your time today. Uh, I find this very apropos, this uh, conversation around Benedict XVI and his dictatorship of relativism, because as we've been discussing in this first segment, I mean, the whole world's facing it, but I think looking at England is a uh, sort of like the canary in the mine shaft. Um, it seems to me like the, the laws, the culture of England has gotten to the point where 
Catholics may not even have a public voice legally to try to evangelize. Uh, and yet I would, I would argue the only real antidote to any of the world's problems is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ through his Holy Catholic Church, his uh, one Catholic and apostolic church. If the bishops, uh, and we, uh, you sort of ended on that point, sort of criticism of the bishops here, and I totally agree. I think it would require the bishops to all come out and say, you know what, enough is enough. It's convert the whole world or die trying. If they had that level of gumption, would they be able to pull this off? Or are we looking at an underground evangelization effort, kind of like the Jesuit missions of the 16th and 17th century? What say you, Dr. Agenden? <clears throat> well, Rod Dreyer, who was a Catholic for some time and then became a, an Orthodox, has written a very important book uh, called The Benedict Option. And he's been saying for some time that we have so completely lost the public debate that we need to prepare for a catacomb living. Um, I think I'll leave it up to people to decide whether or not, you, you can't tell God what's going to happen and there's still scope for repentance and prayer. And, and as you say, for the bishops to come out and speak with a unified voice about defending the, the church, the bride of Christ. Um, the, the, the good news is that people are desperate to be saved. They're desperate to find God. They're desperate to be loved and forgiven and to know what their purpose is. Benedict also had a wonderful phrase where he spoke to some, some, some youth once and he said, you know, each one of you, God thought into existence and thought into being. You, you matter very much indeed. And this, this message of how people matter uh, in the hands of a creator and redeeming God is such a powerful one. People are so hungry for it. But the problem is the church isn't speaking it out. And so we don't know what would happen if the bishops call called the laity to evangelization, if there was suddenly a sense of holy panic about the destruction of Christendom. Um, God, we don't, we don't know what would happen. But if that doesn't happen, then there's no question at all but that we are heading underground. I, I, I couldn't have believed it possible that, that thought crime would actually emerge in the West during my lifetime. I used to smuggle Bibles into the Soviet Union <laughs> and was arrested by the KGB and interrogated and... and uh, I grew up reading Solzhenitsyn. Uh, I, I, I simply, I can't, I can hardly get my head around the speed with which the same, if you like, spirit of totalitarianism has morphed from behind the Iron Curtain in 1989, so that today police will come up to a Catholic woman as she stands on the sidewalk and say, are you praying or not? And if you're praying, we're going to arrest you. I mean, it's incredible. Wow. These are the times we live in. Let's, I'm going to ask you about the King's speech. By the way, one of my favorite films of all time. My family and I love the King's speech. We've probably watched it, I don't know, five or six times at least. Such a good old, fa good old fashioned storytelling, but uh, what a wonderful, what a wonderful film. And then you compare and contrast that to His Majesty King Charles's Christmas speech, his first Christmas speech as the King of England. And uh, in your article, and I read part of this article last week on the show, uh, it seems like he's totally embraced uh, the idea of relativism, of all faiths being equal. And you compare that to his own mother, who seemed to have a much stronger faith in Jesus Christ. Uh, can you give us some insight here? Well, when King, when King Charles, as he now is, grew up, he was very influenced by an explorer and a philosopher called Lawrence van der Post. And van der Post was a friend of Carl Gustav Jung and wrote some very important books. And it became fairly clear that Charles had his mind and his outlook formed by this disciple of Carl Jung. And we didn't know whether he'd grow up or not or grow out of it. Uh, I, was a, I was a psychology lecturer in university, and I also became very fond of Jung, but mainly because he offered an antidote to, to Sigmund Freud, whose ideas... Uh, were prevalent at the time. Uh, I had to I had to fall out of Jung and back in love with Jesus, <laughs> um, but but uh, Charles hasn't done that, and we didn't know what, we we simply didn't know what his inner heart, minds, and thoughts were until he became king. But his first act was to gather together major uh, leaders of the different faiths. And, and 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 implement what he said he was always going to implement, which is become a uh, de defender of faiths instead of the title which was uh, which had been taken by the Protestant Parliament, uh, copying the one that the Pope had given Henry VIII, uh, defender of the Protestant faith. So. Um, Charles's speech was really quite subtle, and it was very well done, and lots of people thought it was exactly what it was called for. But the problem was that it, it embraced relativity entirely. 
And the difficulty is that it just doesn't tell the truth. It doesn't tell the truth about the nature of the religions that you're trying to draw, draw into a relativistic relationship with each other. Um, we know that Islam does not see itself as in a relativistic relationship with Christianity. Christianity ought not to see itself in a relativistic relationship with Islam. There is no way of making Jesus and Muhammad compatible. The gospel and Sharia law are two very different things. Uh, and to pretend that they're not is to simply ask for trouble, because at some point, both religions, in the, but more likely Islam, will break cover and say, actually, we, we, we are, we're not simply part of the whole. We have far, far greater ambitions to uh, to make the whole of society Islamic. Now, Christianity ought to have, does have the same ambitions to make our whole society Christian. But we've given up on them and the Muslims haven't, much to our great shame. It's made more difficult to have uh, the emblematic head of a large religious organization embrace this entirely false an unreliable relativism because it because it it gives comfort to, to to the laziness of Christians who aren't reading the gospels clearly and are not saying their prayers very well and just deepening the hole into which we're sliding. Now I know uh, I I see clear differences between law in America in regards to the, our president and uh, law in England in regards to its king. But as king, could he not say a word in defense of this woman who was arrested for simply praying silently in front of an abortion mill? I mean, could he not, uh, because he is a Christian, because he is a man of, uh, of faith, supposedly, uh, why, why, what would stop him or prevent him from defending Christians in English society, even if law does not allow him to, to do, take some physical, uh, you know, step or move or action to, uh, to defend them? Do you, do you get the sense of what I'm saying? Oh, oh, completely. Um, one of the things we have to, to do in order to explain the constitutional position of the monarch is to say that the, the king is two people at once. So he's his, he's, he's his public persona, which is the king, and his public persona is entirely constrained by parliament. We had a civil war like you did, and, and the, the outcome of the civil war was that parliament controls the monarchy. So in that sense, he's a puppet king, a puppet to parliament. Everyone knows that, and they live with it. It's, it, it's, it, it's full of pageant and, and history, but that's where the power lies. However, he has influence behind the scenes, an enormous amount of influence. And one of the things he's been telling us over the last 40 years is he's been using his influence for ecology in particular. And one of the very good things he's done is to help kids in the inner cities with employment prospects, where, again, he's used his influence and his money. So he could use his influence here, uh, but there isn't any indication that he's doing so. And and I think that's where, that's where I feel the criticism. The problem is that, that if... If in the front, if you like, on, on the surface of things, he is simply endorsing a situation, the direction of which will be to destroy the church, destroy Christendom, destroy civil liberty and the privilege of conscience, but doing nothing underneath it, then, then effectively he's aiding and betting the destruction of his own society. And one of the things I was trying to do with that article was to wake people up and say, actually, we need a Christian king who behind the scenes will be Christian uh, and start exercising that kind of influence. But we, we particularly need someone to draw us together. It could have been the Archbishop of Canterbury, but it isn't. It could be the Cardinal Archbishop of Westminster, but it isn't. Uh, it could have been the king, but it isn't. So at the moment, there's, 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 there's nobody. Um, and uh, the great dangers of the forces that we face are so hostile, both to the human condition and above all to Christianity. They're spiritually and psychologically hostile, that without some form of defense or organization, uh, the destruction of our Christian culture is going to happen much more quickly and much more much more effectively than it would do otherwise. Dr. Ajitin, you know, that made me think of the fact that, you know, we really need to return to Catholicism in England. And that's a huge deal. I think about the prophecy saying that um, England, uh, England will not return to the faith until England returns to Walsingham. And so, uh, you know, people are we talking about secretism, talking about all these things. The Anglican ordinary or the personal ordinary, the chair of St. Peter, we have that in Houston, Texas, where we're located, the uh, Walsingham here, their cathedral. Uh, what do you think about the personal ordinary? Full disclosure, I have a lot of friends who attend the ordinary, a lot of people, and I think it does a lot of good. But I have this kind of cold up where I'm like, if you're going to become Catholic, why don't you embrace Catholic England instead of Anglican England. Uh, so what say you, Dr. Agenden? 
Well, I think you're right. There are two ways of doing this. Um, and for a while, I was a, a seminarian in the in the ordinariat here. Um, but I, I think I think I see the ordinariat as, if you like, offering a particular kind of liturgical health course. Uh, what, what the ordinariat offers to the the wider Catholic Church is a is is a restitution of some of the the, the liturgical beauty that the Holy Spirit provided for uh, for the for the best parts of the church of england but you're right it, it it it's not enough it can't be a special club what one of the things i've been saying and people don't like me much for saying it is that the the only hope for england is the catholic church and not just the ordinary but but the whole catholic church because it is the only organization with the philosophical muscle and integrity to confront the heresy of relativity that we have and uh, and you know if the catholic church stirred itself if it became awake if it found its courage, if it moved from being a, a sort of sectarian subculture, as it has been over the last 150 years, but the fault the fault of that is lies with the English state. But nonetheless, whoever fault it is, it has to come out from behind this sectarian subculture and in, and and claim England for its own as the church in England, the church that, that spent a thousand years building the society upon which our civilization was constructed. But it's it's been it's it's been subject to snobbishness and marginalized and uh, association with, with non-English culture. But that, that needs to change now. 10% of the Catholic clergy in England at the moment are ex-Anglicans. There's been a great influx. It's time for the Catholic Church to understand the great responsibility that God has given it to help save Christendom and to act as, as, as spiritual as well as, as it turns out. It will also be political saviors to, to people who inhabit Christendom. Well, we are out of time, but uh, what a great conversation with Dr. Dr. Gavin Ashington. God bless you. God love you. Thank you for your time today. You can read his articles, which I highly recommend, at catholicherald.co.uk, or you can hang out on his website and find a lot more information there, plus his podcast, ashington.org. God bless you, Dr. Ashington. Thank you again for your time. Thank you for having me on. God bless you, too. That is going to do it for hour number one. I'll give you the latest details on Pope Benedict XVI's funeral arrangements coming up at the top of the next hour. GRNOnline.com forward slash CDT. I'm Debbie Giorgiani. And I'm Adam Bly. We're the hosts of The Spirit World every Saturday morning on the Guadalupe Radio Network. Join us as we help answer your questions on angels, demons, and how the physical and spiritual worlds interact. That's The Spirit World from the Station of the Cross Studios every Saturday at 11 a.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Central, right here on the Guadalupe Radio Network. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. G.K. Chesterton says, All comfort must be based on discomfort. What's that supposed to mean? It has something to do with the fact that we celebrate Christmas in December. It is the feast in the middle of winter. We are choosing to be joyful at the very moment when the whole material world around us is most sad. We are defying cold death outside by celebrating life inside. And that's why there's nothing more comfortable than a blazing fire in the middle of a blizzard. And why we bring a green tree inside and decorate it and talk of good cheer in the face of darkness and death. Tidings of comfort and joy. Because all comfort is based on discomfort. Want more than a minute? Visit us at Chesterton.org. Are you looking for peace? Longing for joy? Want to meet the giver of all goodness? God is calling the laity to bring Ignatian prayer into the suffering world. Work for the new evangelization. Go to LordTeachMeToPray.com. Order your free digital training and manual. Find true happiness and everlasting joy. Go to LordTeachMeToPray.com. And click on the red button today. It's free. Approved by the USCCB. Are you on the CDT Insider email list? Hi, Joe McLean here. And every week I send you cool stuff straight to your inbox, goodies that you're not going to want to miss. Go to grnonline.com forward slash CDT and get signed up today.
guys. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time, keeping you informed and inspired. I'm your host, Joe McClain. So good to be on with you. Praise be to God. Happy New Year and good morning to you. I just, I'm curious. I got the uh, 2023 car raffle postcard in the mail. I don't know who designed this, but it's beautiful. I mean, it's just stunning to look at this artwork. It's chilly. Uh, the polar white. It's polar. Polar white, CLA 250. I think this is the not one of the. Hmm, is this the nicest? Is this the nicest car we have raffled to date? Is the question. The first year was a Studebaker. Hmm. But that was like a one off. It was donated. It was worth a lot of money. It's definitely the top two for uh, like Rudy's a memory. But that was, uh, yeah, hmm. I joined in that year. And so I, I came in a little late for that one. Then, then it became Mustangs and Camaros for a while. Then it was mm. a Cadillac, which I thought was super cool. I'm about to blaspheme. Oh, no. Look, mm-hmm. I don't like American muscle cars. What? Yeah. Okay. Uh, turn his mic off, please. I, I'm uh, not a fan of them. Uh, Rudy is to be canceled from here on out. European all the way. He is officially canceled. Just did it. Uh, the, the Camaro <laughs> is, the new Camaro is pretty legit, man. I mean, mm. it's got legit eh. racetrack eh. specs. Mm. What do you mean? Uh, if you want to go straight, eh. I mean, I suppose. <laughs> no. Don't drag race it. Or, uh, no, I that's guess. no, that's the Dodge. That's the Hellcat that does <laughs> that. It only goes straight, and it only goes straight fast. But no, no, the Camaro and even the Mustang have track-focused versions that are pretty, pretty intense. Mm. Although, you know what we ought to? Uh, I think maybe next year, the brand new... Uh, flat, a plane crank Corvette that just released the 2023 version. <laughs> they, you, did you hear that they took a Ferrari motor? I think it was a Ferrari four five four five eight, and they reverse engineered the motor and built one for themselves for the brand new Corvette. And it sounds like a Ferrari. Hmm. It is, man. Isn't that legal? One hundred and fifty thousand, one hundred thirty thousand dollars. I mean, good luck buying the Ferrari equivalent to that. I mean, a lot more money. So. We're just going to truck. I think it's you should the believe price. in America, Joe. Rudy Carlos. What are you and, talking and about? stop going all snobby European on us. You, you're not going to even be able to put gasoline in it in five years. So <laughs> That's true. That's a good What's point. What's the point? I don't know. But uh, who, uh, who was I listening to? Somebody was saying recently they're getting a mm-hmm. attack for dissing electric cars, and they were like, look, dude. I actually don't have any anything against electric cars. All I'm saying <laughs> is I hate being forced to give up my yeah. gas vehicles. Yeah. That's all it is. I don't know. I don't, the Hummer EV is pretty baller looking. Exactly. He's like, it's I don't have a problem with really EVs. Cool. I just don't want to be forced you know, to give up my gas cars. Do you have any idea what it costs to fill a Hummer EV's electric battery? $92. Like 100 bucks. That's still per cheaper fill. than gas. <laughs> I don't know. Speaking of force, though, we're forcing you. I don't spend you. 100 bucks to fill my Tahoe. We're forcing you guys mm-hmm. to participate in the car raffle. No, we're not. Stop <laughs> it. But, okay, going back to my original point before I got so distracted oh, there. My bad. Uh, that's the kind of conversation we can expect in the after show, by the way. But uh, nonetheless, this year is a, is a 2023 Mercedes-Benz CLA 250. And I have to say, it's got to be one of the nicest looking uh, cars we've ever given out. It looks fast. It looks, it looks swift, I would and say. And comfortable. Swift, but luxurious like it's elegant mm. it's got elegant sweeping lines i like that it's a, a very interesting color the polar white color Brr. so 25 dollars a ticket or you can get five for a hundred bucks so that's an extra one uh absolutely uh gratis and you can do so on our website grnonline.com uh but here's the kicker if you really want to be supportive what you do is you call your local grn station manager and you say listen all right, I'm going to need some tickets. But more importantly, how can I help you sell as many tickets as possible to support the GRN's radio postulate and, you know, sort of make sure that our market gets a little extra favor in the in the drawing. You know, I'm I'm not I'm not saying there's a competition. <laughs> tell them, tell them CDT sent you. There's a competition. Okay. You know, who's going to sell Wait, the there's, most? There's good news and bad news, Joe. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The good news is we have all the money we need to run the GRN. Okay. The bad news is it's in their pockets. It's in, it's in their so pockets. So they got to give it to us. That's, <laughs> that's bad. But this is a winner. You could not only support the GRN financially, but you could also maybe win a cool car in the process. And it is a lot of fun. Praise be to God. So uh, what a great way to support the GRN. Call your local station manager. You can get the contact information on the mobile app, by the way. 
Just uh, download the Guadalupe Radio Network mobile app in your iOS or Android app store. And uh, you can not only listen to your local GRN radio station, find programming information, podcast information. You can donate there, but you can also find the local contact information. Call your station manager and ask the difficult question of, how can I help you? 10x this thing this year. Sell more car raffle tickets at my parish, my Bible study, my group, or, or what have you. Uh, that would be a fantastic way to support the GRN. Or you can just go to the website, grnonline.com, for the details. Praise be to God. Uh, all right, so Benedict XVI was big news over the weekend. Mm-hmm. And a lot of people have been asking what comes next, a topic that Adrian and I discussed last week. I actually put out a video on that very topic as well. But uh, here's an article out of the CNA to talk about what we can expect next. So we do know that his body was first laid uh, you know, in in view, what is the proper terminology when you put a? I don't know. It's not like in a wake. wake. He's it's not, not really wake. He's not in a coffin. He's still really on kind of a board. Like a. Hmm. I think they, they just call it a viewing now. A viewing. It's Late, odd to me. Late There's got to be a state? technical name for this, right? In state? I like, a, yeah, I'm looking for the, what's the technical name? I don't know. Let us know. If let, you know, if a, you're watching state? online, yeah. let us know. In situ? Uh, I have no idea. So he was first in, at the monastery there in uh, in the Vatican Garden where he was living and where he passed. By the way, um, notice in the chapel there, it's at Orientum. Just putting that out there. Mm. Uh, but then he was moved. Yesterday he was moved. Yesterday morning he was moved to uh, St. Benedict. Or rather, St. Uh, ben- <laughs> yeah, it's too soon. Benedict was moved to St. Peter's Basilica, where he will remain. And already, I hear tens of thousands of people have already paid their respects, and they're going to continue to do so until Thursday. So here's a little bit of this article uh, from the CNA on what to expect. It says, after his death, the remains of Benedict XVI remained at the Mater Ecclesia Monastery, his place of residence since his resignation in 2013. The small monastery is located in the Vatican Gardens on a hill behind St. Peter's Basilica. On January the 1st, 2023, the Holy See released the first images of the body of Pope Emeritus with a rosary in his hand and lying at the foot of the altar in the monastery's chapel. The chapel is the same place where, in addition to celebrating Mass, it received public visits from Pope Francis and the new cardinals every time there was a consistory in the Vatican. Since it continues to be Christmas liturgically, this chapel still has a small Christmas tree and a manger. Yeah, the cardinals always visited him. Very interesting. Again, I think that led to some of the confusion that uh, has arisen among the faithful. Article goes on to say, next to the remains of Benedict XVI, some kneelers were placed for prayer. A few hours later, dozens of people, including cardinals, bishops, priests, Vatican workers, nuns from different congregations, and even journalists who cover the activities of the Holy See, were able to enter the monastery to keep vigil and pray with the remains of Pope, with the Pope before they were transferred to St. Peter. At 7 a.m., January the 2nd, the body of Pope Emeritus was transferred from the Mater Ecclesia Monastery to St. Peter's Basilica to begin the wake and allow thousands of pilgrims to say their last goodbyes. The archpriest of the Basilica received the remains of Benedict XVI with a liturgical act that lasted about 30 minutes. He incensed his body and uh, used uh, the uh, holy water as well upon the body of Benedict XVI. Among the attendees were Bishop Georg Gonsfein, who was his personal secretary since 2003, the master of liturgical celebrations, Bishop Diego Rovelli as well. From 9 a.m. to 7, uh, the faithful from all over the world were allowed to enter St. Peter's Basilica to visit the body of Benedict XVI. It is estimated that at least 65,000 people came to visit the Pope Emeritus on the first day of his wake. The remains of Benedict XVI will remain on display in St. Peter's Basilica until Wednesday to January the 4th. Visiting hours for Tuesday and Wednesday are from 7 to 7. The funeral of Benedict XVI, Pope Francis will preside over the funeral of Benedict XVI on Thursday, January the 5th, 9.30 a.m. Rome time in St. Peter's Square. That's about 3.30 in the morning on the East Coast. That's 2.30 in the morning uh, Central Standard Time. Two official state delegations, uh, those of Italy and Germany, will attend the funeral of Pope Emeritus. Only two. I found that fascinating. Only two countries are sending official uh, groups to attend the funeral. You'd have thought that had been more. He was a pretty monumental historical figure in our recent times. You'd have thought that had been more. The president of Italy was one of the first to visit the funeral chapel of Pope Benedict XVI. Prime Minister 
Georgia Maloney, accompanied by other officials from her government, also attended the morning of, on Monday and prayed for several minutes before the remains of Pope Emeritus. Many other heads of state will come to pay respects and attend the funeral in an unofficial capacity, including the president of Hungary, the president of Poland, uh, uh, King Philip of Belgium, the Queen Sophia of Spain, among others. The funeral of Benedict will be held at 9.30 a.m. Thursday, January the 5th. You can always watch it live. It'll be streamed over EWTN for sure. So th that's what we can expect. Now, there was some... There was some uh, not controversy, but some conflict. Some it was reported by Bree Dale. I think it was uh, was that Saturday morning, Sunday morning, maybe it was Sunday morning. It was or no Saturday. I think Bree Dale reported that the bells had not rung. They didn't ring the bells to announce his passing. Uh, and yet, uh, Colm Flynn on EW10 reported that they did in fact ring bells across Rome. So the question is, what was the difference? Breedale clarified later saying that, they, that there are particular bells that, were, that are to be rung just for the Pope, and those bells were not rung. But it was just church bells around the town that rang for him at some point. So there was some, there was some debate about what, in fact, to expect. There was also a report that Pope Emeritus Benedict XVI did not want a rather extravagant uh, funeral like a pope. He wanted it to be much more simple. So everybody was wondering what exactly would happen. Well, now we know he will, in fact, receive his funeral. He is lying in state right now in, in uh, St. Peter's Basilica. Thousands and thousands and thousands of people are going to come and pay their last respects. And uh, so it will be sort of a more of a muted papal funeral, so to speak. And he's going to be buried in the crypt where JP2 was first buried uh, before he was elevated to the canon and then raised and then moved upstairs into the, the basilica floor. So when you're down in the crypt and you are standing and you're looking down the hall, the glass through the glass doors and looking down the hall at where St. Peter's uh, sarcophagus is, where his bones are kept, or at least a portion of them anyway. If you look to your right, you know, you look to your left, there's a chapel. Look to your right, there's a there's the place where Benedict XVI will will stay. So, very interesting story. We can, we'll, we'll probably expect to hear more and see more in the coming days. But let me just ask you two guys, while we have a few minutes before we play Fear and Trembling, what do you think his lasting legacy will be? If you had to pick one, what would Lasting be? legacy? Well, <clears throat> I can speak personally. Uh, his... Uh, his uh, motu proprio, try, uh, not try to say it's because Samorum Pontificum, Samorum Pontificum uh, really deepened my understanding of, of Catholicism, and it brought me into a deeper love of our blessed Lord Jesus Christ. So for me, his legacy will always be that. Uh, it'll, it'll be that, uh, that uh, you know, um, that and also his uh, speaking about relativism. Relativism at the time, 2012, was when I was coming back into the church. I was thinking about this. There's all kinds of different things that, that are stealing our attention from Christ. And so, mm -hmm. you know, he's, uh, he's got, he's got a, a, a big part of my heart there. And uh, sorry to see him go, but, you know, it'll come. It's sure to come, right? I yeah. Mean, comes I for think, us all. I think that uh, his Samoran Pontificum should have been his legacy, but I don't think it will be because of Traditionus Custodis and everything that's happened afterwards, that'll be forgotten. It'll be in the trash bin of history. I think his legacy will be his uh, resignation. I think that's yeah, what he'll be known for. Have no everything agreed. else will be forgotten. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. I was surprised to learn that he wrote a personal note to the FSSP after Traditionus Custodis came out to encourage them because he knew how difficult this would be for yeah. traditional Catholics in particular. And uh, for, you know, I wonder, I'm curious if he wrote a similar note to Institute of Christ the King or uh, the Good Shepherd, I'd be interested to know that. If anybody knows, please let us know. But either way, we pray for the repose of Benedict XVI. All right, it's uh, time to play Fear and Trembling. If you would like to a chance to win prizes, Rudy's back, so we're back to normal now. <laughs> now that I've proven that I'm trustworthy, <laughs> I had to defend myself. Huh. Uh, we'll go back to normal. Call right now, 877-757-9424. Will you be our first guest of 2023? I wonder. You can call right now, 877-757-9424. We'll be right back.
Merry Christmas from the Guadalupe Radio Network in Houston. I'm General Manager Tim Mott, and there is one very important thing that I'm going to shout from the rooftops, from the radio, and from your GRN phone app from now until I can't shout anymore. The incarnation changes everything. Deus fit homo ut homo fieret Deus. God became man so that man might become God. Go look it up. That's what we celebrate on Christmas, and thank you for listening to the Guadalupe Radio Network. This is Dale Alquist with a Chesterton Christmas Minute. G.K. Chesterton says that it's become a bad habit in our society to celebrate Christmas before it comes. We've forgotten the glory of anticipation. The presents should not be opened until Christmas. That, of course, is part of the excitement. And while we know the gifts are coming... Chesterton reminds us that the best kind of gift is the surprise gift. And if we have the right perspective, we should look at everything as a gift and every gift as a surprise gift. We are happy to wake up on Christmas morning and find gifts in our stockings. But the best gift we could ever find in our stockings is our own two legs. Want more than a minute? Visit our website. Chesterton.org. Oh, come, let us adore him. Hi, this is Dave Palmer. Doesn't that perfectly describe our disposition during this Christmas season? We have the honor of being able to adore the Christ child at Christmas and adore him throughout the year in the Blessed Sacrament and receive him at Mass. And what a blessing also that we can tune in to the GRN anytime to keep our minds focused on our Lord Jesus Christ and his Holy Church. Merry Christmas and a blessed new year to you and your family. Welcome to another round of fear and trembling. <laughs> the Catholic trivia game show that helps you work out your salvation by the seat of your pants. It's a 50-50 chance and prizes are involved. Avoid the weeping and gnashing of teeth. Call now to take your shot. 877-757-9424. And now your host, Joe Praise be to Jesus Christ. Welcome back to Catholic Drive Time and Fear and Trembling, a Catholic trivia game show with secrets and agendas. But you have to call to be our contestant. First caller of the year. I wonder who it will be. Could be you. Uh, Phone lines are open. Adrian Fonseca standing by to take your call right now at 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877-757-9424-877-757-9424. First caller gets to play the game. Now, here's how it works, all right? But I'll try to do keep this, but just between the two of us. I don't want anybody to know what we really do here. But number one, we like to teach the faith. So we look for teachable moments in the questions where you might learn something you didn't know before. Praise be to God. And then, of course... We like to have a laugh, a good time, a chuckle, and our callers are amazing. They laugh with us. We enjoy that. And then we give up prizes, which means it's a winner for everybody involved. But if you're new here, the kicker is we don't ask the caller the questions. When they call 877-757-9424, I will ask uh, Rudy and I will ask Adrian, one of which will give us a correct answer. The other will give us an incorrect answer. The caller will then have 15 seconds to make a decision. Whomst do they trust more? Do they trust Rudy? Do they trust Adrian? And then if they get that right, well, then they go into the coffee cup of divine providence to win this week's prize. But you have to call to be the contestant. 877-757-9424. That phone number is 877-757-9424. Rudy, what could they win? Praise be to God. Our sponsor this week is Abbey Roast. Abbey Roast. What is Abbey Roast? Mm -hmm. Well, the Benedictine monks of Our Lady of Guadalupe Monastery in New Mexico offer 100% gourmet Arabica coffee, carefully Mm. roasted in very small batches to bring out the very unique qualities of each of the best coffees that they pick and deliver right to you. Nice. All the proceeds uh, that that, uh, they get from their website, abbeyroast.com, contribute to the expansion of their monastery. Ooh. And uh, and to uh, receive those many vocations that are knocking on their doors. Yeah. The, the winner this week is going to win some of their coffee. Mm-hmm. Now you can let me know you want it ground or you want a whole bean. But you can enjoy it while watching CDT. Yeah, praise be to God. By the way, you, you, get, you have some fulfillment to do. 
Yeah? Uh, we have prizes to ship now that you're back from vacation. I, I just got a call. Totally they rested. Said, hey, where's my, where's my prize? I said, I don't know. I've been on vacation. Don't, wa- sorry. don't worry. You're going to have some shipping to do. <laughs> I'm sorry. Last week's know. winner, maybe the week before that. I mean, you get time to fulfill, bro. <laughs> Welcome back. Praise be Let's go. Good All to be right. back. Well, let's, uh, let's jump on the phones here. Hey, good morning to you, Frank. Good morning. How are you? Frank, I am alive, and that counts. How are you? Uh, likewise, I'm alive, so we're doing good. <laughs> See? It's but a, at what cost? It's a great start <laughs> to the day. Where are you calling from, Frank? I'm calling from Pleasanton, Texas. Wow, it's mm-hmm. Pleasanton. That's, uh, where is that? That's like uh, south of San Antonio? Yeah, 30 minutes south of San Antonio. Ooh, you're way down there. Is it pleasant? What is it, like uh, 182 degrees right now and humid? Or like uh, <laughs> south of San Antonio is like darn near the Earth, the e- equator there. But at, at any rate, what I say. <laughs> how was your Christmas so far? Praise be to Jesus. It's blessed. Yeah? What would you get that you really, really, really loved? Well, you know what? My kids went all out this year, and they got me a new acoustic guitar. So. Oh, wow. Wow. wow! That's big. That's big at my house. Praise be to God. What kind of guitar was it? What's the What's the make and model? It was a Takami. So it was a. Uh, it was one of the beginner levels, but it, it's it's better than what I had. Just say that. Pra- praise be to God. And how long have you been playing? Oh, probably thirty years. Really. Wow, what kind of music? Yes, Are we talking folk music here? What, what's your favorite? Uh, what do you well, like to play? Actually, actually, I started out playing uh, gospel music with one of my friends way back when I was a little old guy. So uh, <laughs> I, we play all we play all varieties, but yeah, nice. Uh, we we started playing out gospel music. Yeah, awesome. Well, Frank, uh, Merry Christmas to you. And uh, sounds like you got some great kids that love their dad. Praise be to Jesus. Are, are you familiar with this game? Do you know how this works? Absolutely. All right. We're going to start with Rudy first, as is our tradition, our custom. Uh, good morning to you, Rudy Carlos. I see the tie good is back morning. in fashion. It is, and I am wearing, <laughs> I'm wearing the uh, the uh, upper room tie here the with upper the upper room tie, the little tongues of fire Got here. It. Okay. So uh, now that I've uh, defended my honor uh, while you are away, clearly everybody knows I'm trustworthy. Oh, okay. Uh, well then, you oh, start. Sure. You, you come back mm-hmm. with a tie on, so. We don't even know where to begin here, but uh, nonetheless, let's just start playing. Rudy, could you tell me, what is the spiritual superior of a community of nuns Mm. in a religious order? What do we call that? Yeah, we call that a Mother Soup Erier. And the reason they call her Mother Soup Erier is because out of all of the nuns, Uh she is the one who has the best soup recipe. So That's, they pick her. I see. They gotta be. They gotta have the right nutrition for their okay. bodies, but also for their soul. Uh-huh. So they, that's how they pick her. It's like Mother soup, soup for the soul. Exactly. I see where yeah. you're going with this. That's okay. exactly right. Mother soup superior. Superior. Got it. All right, Adrian. Maybe you could help with this. Uh, could you tell me what is the spiritual superior of a community of nuns in a religious order called? Mm, yeah. I mean, mm-hmm. going up against Mother <laughs> Superior is. Uh, uh, it's going to be difficult. It's challenging. It, it yes. really is. It really is. Mm-hmm. I'm going to go yeah. with an abbess, though. I'm just going to have to. Sounds too formal. It's, yeah. <laughs> I know. It kind of sounds ridiculous. Yeah. But no. that, that's what I'm going with. Uh, abbess, you said. Abbess. Mm-hmm. All right, Frank, uh, in South Texas, praise be to God. You have two choices here. Adrian is on the hook for abbess. And uh, Rudy is on the hook for mother soup superior. Why are you laughing? I, I, I don't know. Frank, what do you say? Rudy, 15 seconds. I'm going to have to go with Rudy on this one. <laughs> on purpose? <laughs> <laughs> Frank! Frank! Wait, a- Adrian's got me so gun shy, man. I don't know. Oh, what- <laughs> oh, man. oh no, it's my fault. I see how it is. Ooh, <laughs> Frank. Unfortunately, Mother Soup. Superior was uh, not correct. Abbas is the right answer. That is but, correct. Uh, hey, we learned something. But don't worry, Frank. We, we I, did. I got you covered. You're getting in this cut one way or the other. Uh, we're gonna All go. Right. To, we're gonna go to <laughs> Doctor Fonseca, as some would say on Twitter. Anyway, um, Adrian, I know that you have an expertise in wildlife, oh. specifically on the birdologies. Oh. Uh, could you help me? Help me. The red worn by cardinals uh-huh. is called what? Right. So birds, they wear things. 
Uh, I don't know. You're the doctorate uh -huh. and expert in that subject. Uh -huh. You tell me. So no. Um, Assuming we're not talking about birds, I because see. birds don't wear, wear anything. Are you sure? Um, they are mostly naked. I read um, it on your Twitter feed. Sorry, not accurate. Uh, the red worn by cardinals mm -hmm. of the church okay. is called sacred purple. Awkward. Because they don't call it red. Kind of like, you know, like, rose. They don't call it pink. It's rose. Huh? The red worn by cardinals is called sacred purple. Okay, sacred purple, you say. That's what I'm saying. All right, Rudy, could you help me out here? The red worn by cardinals is what? By the way, that sounds like a hippie uh, band, Sacred Purple. But actually, <laughs> it's uh, it's mauve. Mauve is the color. Mauve. Yeah, mauve. Mauve. Yeah. You have to oh. say it like that too. Mauve. 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 Is that, like, is that French? <laughs> uh, I think so. Uh, probably. Yeah. All right, Frank, you got options. The red worn by Cardinals. Uh, Rudy seems to think it's called mauve. Whereas Adrian says it's called the sacred purple. 15 seconds on the clock. Who is right? Who is wrong? Frank, what say you, good sir? Hey, you guys got me stumped this morning. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> let, let, I'm going to go with my first choice again. I'm sticking with Rudy. I can't. No, no, see, Adrian. <laughs> see, Adrian. <laughs> Adrian, I oh, I heard it! I heard it! I heard it! <laughs> I heard it. <laughs> totally, 100%. We don't admit Adrian is correct. However, I, uh, just, I, I just heard Joe say, ten, go with Adrian. I, no, I, I heard him say that. I never that. said that. I, I, I think Roll I heard that. Roll the tape back. You'll see my lips never mm -hmm. move. I didn't hear nothing. Nothing. Mm -hmm. Nothing. But you are correct, Frank. Uh, sacred purple is the correct answer. Which All is, right. Why would yeah. it be called purple and not red? I don't know. It's probably probably something to do with like red not being a available dye or something i have no idea <laughs> Come on. i have no idea. i have no clue or that. maybe maybe uh, this is a topic for the after show but uh, there's like a theory about colors and how red didn't actually exist in the sense of like oh, the way people perceive colors i've heard of this yeah what? but anyway it's a long it's a long That's... thing we we'll talk about it in the after show god would have made it worse if we had come up with that all right so we're going to go over the third question here back to rudy rudy what is another name for the Silicium. Silicium. How do you say that? Silicium. 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 What You're is talking the, about the crown of thorns. Oh. Every bishop has to wear it at least one time. It's part of their Required. initiation hazing ceremony. Is that right? Like yeah. a fraternity almost? Exactly. Yeah. Huh. Uh, it's not done in public. Praise but God. It's a cilium. Si si Cilium. Silly, silicium? Silicium. Okay. It's a crown of thorns. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> We're experts at this, by the way. Excellent. <laughs> okay. Adrian, what say you? Uh, what is another name for a silicium? Yes, depending on ecclesiastical or the uh, classical Latin, it's mm -hmm. silicium or celicium. Oh. I like silicium better. Sounds better. Okay. But that would be a hair shirt. A hair shirt. A hair shirt. Uh, huh. Interesting. I'm seeing a root word there in this Latin phrase you have here. All right, Frank, you got options. And only easy questions today, apparently. But uh, what is another <laughs> name for a Cilicium? Is it a hair shirt, as Adrian has told us? Or is it the crown of thorns, required by all bishops, as Rudy wants us to believe? 15 seconds on the clock. Who's right? Who's wrong? Frank, bring her in for a landing. What say you? Well, since I'm not starting the uh, Sacred Purple band, I'm going to go with Adrian. <laughs> <laughs> Way to go, Frank. Well played. Winning down, go with awesome. Adrian is what well I always say. Played. Frank, you did great. There was a lot of curveball action there, but... There was. A lot of fun. And you learned a few things. And you could win prizes. It's possible. Tune in Friday to find out. But Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. Don't go anywhere, Frank. We're going to put you on hold. We'll see you guys in the after show. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time, where it is our pleasure to keep you informed and inspired. Join us Monday through Friday at the same time, right here on your favorite Catholic radio station. Don't forget to connect with us. Just go to facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Again, that's facebook.com forward slash Catholic Drive Time. Be sure to share more than just us today. Share Jesus with everyone you meet. Bye now, and God love you. Praise be to Jesus, welcome to the after show, where we get a lot more casual about the conversation, and you get to drive that with your commentary, so please leave us a comment right where you're watching right now. 
Where are you from? Let us know. We would love to know. If you're new here, we want to thank you for being here. So give us an opportunity to thank you personally by leaving a first comment ever. That would be amazing. Master Baker, it's good to see you again. Merry Christmas and Happy New Year. Praise be to God. What's on the menu today? Uh, Boy, would I love to know. Alberto, our friend from the UK, good morning to you. Glad to see you here. Uh, Paul, good morning to you. Our friend from Buffalo. Are you a Buffalo Bills fan, Paul? Let us know. Lights, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Lights. Lights. Ten. Uh, I see Sean. Good morning to you, Sean. Jay Coke is in the house. Good to see you here. Uh, Skunky X is back. Skunky X. Yeah, good morning. Bridget Dunn, good morning to you. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. It's been a while. Happy good birthday to, here. to uh, Daniel. Mr. Mr. Baker's in the house. Hello. Good morning to you, Mr. Baker. Are you a new commenter? Kathleen Irish. Lovely uh, name. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, do, 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 do. I'm just scrolling back. Kim Sunderman, good morning to you. Practical Carnivore, poof, good morning to you. Practical Carnivore. That sounds a lot like yeah, Dr. Stein. Dr. Anthony Stein is on the oh, board. By the way, which reminds me, I, I should give you a carnivore update. Okay. You failed. Um, I have sinned. <laughs> against the carnivore? <laughs> against the car. So, for. Uh, Sorry, carnivore. So, I, for those of you that don't know, I back in uh, a year ago this time, <laughs> a year ago today, I was north of 365 pounds a year ago today. It's a pound a day. Um, I've lost some 80 pounds since. Wow. So that's more than seven. It's more than seven. I but I started the. It it came in waves. So I I went. I've been doing intermittent fasting for a long time, but if you're still eating junk, it only goes so far. But in late August, I made the determination to go carnivore, and so I was. I've been on carnivore since late late August. I uh, during Thanksgiving and now during Christmas, I really got lazy. And went keto. <gasps> I know. And I'm sure Anthony Stein is probably just unsubscribed right now. He's probably like, I'm done. I'm out. Can't do this anymore. The disrespect. Like, not even lion anymore. Like, the lion carnivore thing. That's so. Wow. Yeah, but I went to keto for, for the holidays. But I got to get back on the bandwagon because even that feels like it's over, overwhelming. And I still, have some, I still have some ways to go before I get where I'm supposed to be. But uh, so that's the latest on that. Uh, Diane. Diane Crafty Mama. That's got to be a brand new commenter. Diane Crafty Mama. Where's Carol Groon. On Good YouTube? morning to you, Carol Groon. Yeah, on YouTube. Early on, YouTube. early on. They were okay. one of, among the earliest commenters. Well, good morning. Jesus is a Storm and Yvonne. Good morning to you. Jesus is a friend. Praise be to God. Good morning, Katie, Katie Plus. <laughs> Jinx. Jinx. You owe me a Coke. Coke. <laughs> uh, it's over <laughs> master baker 78 says apple cinnamon coffee cakes just came out of the oven are those keto friendly i'm just curious uh, alberto says he lost 300 pounds as in british pounds he lost oh, 300 pounds sterling? some would say quid what did you, 300 what'd quid? you lose it on 300 bob <laughs> You you were betting, man. Yeah, what, Alberto? Can you explain this to me? I don't understand. Why is it in England there are like seventeen ways to say, like a dollar, <laughs> like you know, a pound, like a bottle. We have dollar. that too, right? I mean, we say like, buck. Can I borrow five bucks? Oh, that's can true. I borrow, oh, okay. Yeah. Hey, hey, Five don't, spots. do not insert logic into this <laughs> <Right>. conversation, okay? <laughs> just let us let us just rail in England. <laughs> uh, at any rate, good morning to you, John Paddock and Michelle Vaughn. Good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. I see Gloria Deanne Lopez in the house. Praise be to God, Jane Stevens as well. Good Thank you, to you, Deacon. I don't know for letting us know that he's lying in state. Lying in state. Yes, true. Uh, Lori is here. Laura Lasdow. Good morning to you. Sonia Morales. Praise be to God. Jesus Robles. June Yabara, praise be to God. Good morning to you. E.S. Giselle, good morning to you. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Good to see you guys. Uh, I see Bandage245, good morning to you. I see Empty Spiel. Uh, let's see, uh, Gunslinger is on as well. Uh, Sci-Fi is in the house. Brick Wall's back from Virginia. And, of course, Deacon, I don't know, it's been mentioned. And over on our Telegram group, by the way, did you know we have a Telegram group? Luz Lozano, good morning to you, Rudy Carlos. 
Good morning to you, T-Storm. Praise be to God. Good morning to you, Monica Cortez. Clarissa's over there. Clarissa, what do you think your chances are of winning a second Mercedes? <laughs> Can we go back to back victories there? That would be hilarious. Imagine. You would be the GOAT if, in that case. dude. As some would say, some young kids would say, that would be so goaded. <laughs> Nick the Mike, good morning to you. Uh, good morning. Thanks for hanging out with us today. Uh, by the way, is, is today not Clarissa's husband's birthday? It is. Daniel? Happy birthday, uh, Daniel. According to the chat. How old? I don't know. Uh, 45. I think we're the same age. 50. 30, 33? 32? Really? What? I, I have socks that are older than that. That's really? Kind of cool. yeah. They lasted that long? <laughs> What's your oldest piece of clothing? I have a shirt from middle school. I have I my still high school letter jacket. Mm. You still wear it? I don't wear yeah. it. So you can fit in it? Yeah. That's insane. Yeah. What? Well, the sad part is that it was big when I was in middle Mary, school. Mary, Mary, oh. good morning to you. Now it's a snug fit. So I, you're, you're a big I've, boy in middle school. I've gained school. 20 pounds. Oh. Uh, <laughs> no, yeah. I'm, I'm the oldest thing I own. I still have a, a shirt from when I was a child when I was in elementary school, and I can't fit in it, obviously. I have socks school, from high school. I don't, yeah, I don't know. They're threadbare, though. They're I should tell you. <laughs> They're useless. Yeah. Praise be to God. By the way, did you guys get any socks for Christmas? Merry yeah, Christmas, I did, That is such a, th my wife is big into that kind of thing. Pajamas and socks. That's all she wants. I'm like, are you kidding me? That doesn't even count. It's like a real present, getting people pajamas. <laughs> but that's her thing, man. Yeah, straight up, I got I got socks. I like socks, though. I got socks and ties. Socks and ties. Yeah. Yikes. Mary Mary wants to know, how can I find you on Telegram? Uh, all right, so I was supposed to send an email on Friday and never did. Wow. Yeah, kind of like these prizes that were. Kind of like out. some of our guests that don't show. Huh. Uh, I failed the show. <laughs> so there's that. So Joe's canceling himself now. Canceling myself. I'm uh, punishing myself. Uh, uh, there's some interesting, uh, there's a uh, a tweet that's being passed around. Uh-oh. Jay right Cook now. says flog Joe. Will do. <clears throat> yeah, it's coming. Post haste. Uh, Gone swine. Quote, I believe it broke Pope Benedict's heart to read Traditionis Custodis. To take this treasure of the old mass away from the people. Well, I can't say I'm comfortable with that. Close quote. Archbishop mm -hmm. Georg Gonsfein. Well, I'm glad he wasn't comfortable with it. Yeah. Unfortunately, he did nothing. Yeah. Well, he wrote he wrote letters of encouragement behind the scenes. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I think. Uh, I don't know, man. Also, you know, one thing mm -hmm. is people were talking about like. Isn't it weird that he only wrote one to the FSSP? Well, or maybe he did write one to the other, yeah, other groups. They just didn't How, announce it. Exactly. I was like, however, should they tell everybody about private correspondence? Well, the FSSP didn't didn't even share it until after his passing. I mean, that's what I'm saying. Like yeah. even, even even then, huh? Yeah. Like, like is it is it appropriate? Like just as a general principle, mm -hmm. if you know someone and you had private correspondence with them, is it then okay? to reveal it after their death. And if maybe, like you might say, eventually after the death, but immediately after their death? Yeah. Like, well, I don't know. I don't know what the principle is there. Uh, how long would it take before mm -hmm. you're like... And the same thing. It's like, they say, don't speak ill of the dead. Um, so how long? What's the, like, the waiting like, period? What's, what's the, the... What's the... You know, kind of like if we go to the... Where canon law talks about how to treat... Pope Emeritus's for their funeral. Right. It's under uh -huh. that section. Uh -huh. You just look right there, and it specifies okay, the Okay, I'll pull that up right now. I'll yeah, pull that, pull that up. out. Okay, pulling it up. <clears throat> yeah. uh, it's it right the, here. It says... Um, I think it references the Fifth Council of, of Chalcedon. So just... Right. You can go there as well. The, the Fifth Council of Chalcedon. The Fifth one, yes. Yes, okay. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. Mm -hmm. Totally. Yeah. Here, I'll read it to you. So, yes. All right, there, there you, you go. go. There you go. It's there. It's red. It's Eclair. been red. Eclair. I Klar, promise I Klar, won't disclose anything. As they say in German, anything. Deutschland, Klar, das ist Klar. I promise I won't disclose anything a few hours after you're dead. I'll wait 24 <laughs> hours. <laughs> You'll wait at least I'll wait a week, hours. you know, I'll wait at least a week. Yeah, I don't know. I don't know what the rule is. I don't know what the principle is. I bet there's custom. I, 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 I genuinely think that there's probably, kind of like how we have like British common law, I bet there was like a custom where you knew like, oh, you don't speak ill of the dead. You don't, you don't associate anything like that for like this amount of time. You leave their everything private for this amount of time. I bet that was like a thing. Yeah. Maybe. But I don't know. Maybe. 
Uh, Bandage245, good morning. Off to work soon, but joining in to see what's up with everyone. God bless. Praise be to God. How was everybody's New Year's? Uh, did you guys get word of the uh, terrorist attack, the machete attack on New York City yeah, police officers wild. in Times Square? I guess we need to ban guns. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, that was wild. I was like, what on earth? You know what's what funny? I didn't thing. even see that headline. Really? I know. That's, <laughs> that's kind of... It's kind of my point. Is and that's like, kind of my job. <laughs> they had to evacuate the square, and yet hardly anybody talks about it. When did this happen? Yesterday? New Year's, New Year's, New Year's Eve. Oh, New Year's, yeah, New Year's Eve. Eve, rather. Yeah. Yeah. Tim Pool. Tim Pool was there, so he talked about it, so I got some information off of him. It was Tim Pool. He it did it? It was not Tim Pool. Maybe it was Tim Pool. How can I prove that? I mean, the guy was 19. Tim oh, Pool man. looks like he's 19. <laughs> it's possible. Yeah, well, <laughs> the whole thing is... It's kind of wild. Suspect. Yeah. You know, I did want to bring up again that uh, Jesus says he still wears his his high school stuff. That makes more sense. Like you're <laughs> you're in high school, you're about the same size as you're ever going to be, unless you like just get unless gain a lot of weight and stuff like that. But I can't even wear my my head is bigger. You could than be when I same, served in the Marine Corps. You could be the same size <laughs> as you were in high school, though. Like everyone could be. Like you're pretty much, especially men, you're pretty much done growing by the time you're done with high school. Mm. So that makes sense. But, uh, you know, the, the question you asked um, about, like, what do you think the legacy of Benedict XVI will be? Mm-hmm. You know, I really, it's, it's interesting because people are saying, you know, they're going to scapegoat Benedict XVI. Then other people are saying, no, they're going to canonize him. And people are saying, okay, this is going to be his legacy. No, that's going to be his legacy. And he was the last of Vatican II, uh, you know, people participants. Who were there, yeah. People he were wasn't the, the father. Council. He was just one of the advisors. But nonetheless, mm-hmm. he was one of the theologians. I at think the council. if they if they lay everything at, uh, to blame at his doorstep, it would look bad. It looks bad in Vatican II. I think so. I think they're going to canonize him. I don't think they're going to use him as a scapegoat. And the other question is, uh, the question of the scapegoating. The other question is, was it actually his fault? <laughs> like well, it's not scapegoating it, if it's I, actually. Was I listened his fault. to several commentaries over the weekend. I listened to Taylor Marshall, to, uh, Timothy Gordon, even Bishop Barron, and I read some articles too to get various opinions on sort of his le- lasting legacy. And I find it very interesting because it does seem like he he came out swinging in the early days of his pontificate, but then he lost steam and he sort of gave up. And I think that's my problem with him ultimately. Like, he, he did more to try to bring about a justice in regards to the sex abuse scandal than the current pontificate has. The, the pontificate just before him had, you know what I mean? Like, he was actually prosecuting bishops and priests on the down low behind the scenes. I kind of wish he'd have done that publicly, uh, because public scandal deserves to, uh, public, uh, you know, information. But nonetheless, behind the scenes, he was, in fact, punishing. He did, in fact... Put McCarrick on the on the back burner, but why didn't he defrock McCarrick? Why didn't he why didn't he punish McCarrick more severely? This whole let, let him off with prayer and fasting routine, like I don't understand that. I just don't get that. <clears throat> but then it seemed like he got overwhelmed, and the wolves, as he as he warned that they were surrounded by the wolves, and he warned the world that he had you know felt this way. Don't let the wolves get to him. But uh, nonetheless, he was still the Pope. Like, I just don't understand why he felt the need to ultimately retire and leave the wolves in charge of the thing. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, like, the, all the, the Benny Plinist, um, or as if they like to say, um, the Benedict is Pope position, which I guess he's not Pope anymore if he's dead. Uh, <laughs> well, that clarifies but things. That, clarif- that does clarify things. <laughs> you know, that, the people who are, have that position... You know, it was always interesting to me because they always were saying things like, oh, Benedict is going to come and save the day. He's going to release a document laying everything out. And, I mean, now would be the time, right? If he wrote something that was to be released after his death, um, when will we see that? I'm waiting for it. Mm-hmm. And I'd, I'd love to see Benedict come out and say, these were the errors of the Francis Pontificate. These were the things that I disagreed with. These are things that were bad. Um, yet every step of the way, minus the private letter to the fraternity, he's said explicitly that he sees his papacy in continuity yeah. with Francis. Right, yeah. He says he supports all the Francis decisions. A contemplative pope. He blessed every all the cardinals he made, all the bishops he made, yeah. were, went to go see Benedict, and he blessed them. Right. So, I mean... Confusing. It's, it's not just confusing. It's um, like Benedict is... Uh, 
he's a not he's not a simple character that we can just say yeah. Benedict was the devil or Benedict was a saint and we need to canonize him and make him a doctor of the church now. Hey, um, um, real quick, bad idea. By the way, Master Baker says his father's in hospice care. Let's pray for his father as he is preparing to uh, visit the, see the just judge, just like Benedict did recently. You know, and I, I read those comments too from Benedict. I put out a video on my Joe McLean YouTube channel about that. His 2000 and 2022 letter in February, I think it's February 6th, 2022, he wrote that letter published by the Vatican response to the, uh, uh, the sex abuse scandal in the Diocese of Munich. And in the last two paragraphs, he talks about how he's about to go face the just judge and how that yeah. must uh, feel like pretty intense, right? Because when you're the Pope, there's the weight of the world on your shoulders. The decisions, what you have failed to do, what you have done, what you have failed to do is a very real and serious thing. So he was preparing himself to visit the judge, judge, but he was also hoping and 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 uh, counting in the mercy of, of our Lord and Savior Jesus, who died for even his sins. So uh, prepare yourself well, and I know, Master Baker, you're you are trying to do that for your dad. So we're going to continue to pray for yeah. your family. Master Baker said his father-in-law. They're trying to. They're in the process of getting him baptized, but he's not always lucid. <clears throat> but yeah, I you know if I was you, and uh, you are visiting him, and he happens to be lucid. Uh, while you're there, yeah, do it yourself and then get a priest to do it, um, conditionally, yeah. conditionally whenever you can. So if a, if you can get a priest out there yeah. and baptize him with all the, uh, the accompanying rites, mm -hmm. that would be the best situation. But if you're with him and he happens to be lucid and you know, he's rarely it. lucid. Yeah, I would do it. I just do it. It's baptize him. Very important. Um, but yeah, so that's a big deal. And also... Feel free. I mean, this is, this is what we did with my grandma. Why we we um, got her the last rites mm -hmm. before her death, or before she was on death's door. We did it a couple weeks ago, if y'all remember. Uh, thank you, everybody, for praying for her. Um, she was lucid enough to talk to the priest, and uh, the and so that's why we did it. We did it earlier because we wanted to make sure she was able to at least make somewhat of a good confession mm -hmm. that she was able to be lucid whenever she was receiving the the rites. Uh, so I, I highly recommend doing it sooner rather than later and then pray that he's lucid when the priest comes. So, yeah. I read an article um, for over yesterday, actually. I read this article that was from Matteo. Uh, oh, no. Matteo. No, forgive me. Hold on one second. I'm just trying to send myself the link so I can post it in the chat. But uh, I read this article that was very good and a very interesting take because uh, let me just get it in front of me so I can explain it to you. This is uh, from Marco Tosati, and it's uh, about Ratzinger and Fatima and Triconius and Tyconius as an interpretive key for the end of times. And it points out and early in uh, Pope Benedict XVI's pontificate, he's making these veiled references to Tyconius's interpretation of the apocalypse, the end times, and the coming of the of the Antichrist. And so this article by Marco Tosati discusses this and how even in Fatima there is an interpretation of two popes, a bishop in white as, oh, com yeah. as compared to a pope. Hmm. And there are a lot of people today who, and this article kind of go, goes into it, who believe that the death of Benedict XVI opens the way for the coming of the Antichrist. Very mm. interesting stuff. I'm not telling you to believe this. Yeah. I'm just telling you it's fascinating. And the, I'm going to post a link the problem to, with it, to though, this in the chats. Part of the prophecy was that he would flee Rome. Mm. And uh, he didn't. Right. Yeah. And so that was uh, one of the things. I forgot about this already. Yeah, a lot of the people who were the Benedict's Pope position was saying that, oh, well, even now, because they were talking about whenever he was getting sick, even now he, he could leave Rome. Like it could it could happen. Like he could... They could fly him out of Rome. Something could happen, and they were really banking on that. But he he died in Rome, yeah. so it, that is interesting. Yeah, yeah, hmm. very, it's very fascinating. Anyway, well, he has left Rome. He's well, left he certainly Rome has left officially. Rome now. Well, no, he's he gonna fled be... Rome to uh, his judgment seat. Yeah, exactly, to his judgment yeah. seat. So very, very fascinating for sure. And I'm sure there's going to be a hot debate that's going to rage for a while on Benedict the Sixteenth. On uh, you know, and I keep going back to. Just watching that 2014 Frontline special on Inside the Vatican, 
where they interviewed all these gay priests who are in these gay priest parties underground and how they thought the church should change its teachings and how uh, Maciel was being protected by JP2, who had so many illicit children, was raping his own children, let alone seminarians and boys in the Legionnaires of Christ, and, and how Benedict wanted to uh, censure him. But it's like such grave public scandal, such grave darkness. Shouldn't all of that be dealt with in the light? I don't know, man. I don't like this behind the scenes, closed door stuff. I just, we talked about that with Ken Gore as well, with Fulton Sheen. And I know that was the way the church, even, even, even Padre Pio would not allow public scandal when it came to the church. Yeah. He, he allowed himself to be imprisoned for 10 years in order to protect the church and her reputation. That's the way things were back then. And, yeah, and to some degree, they still are. Yeah, but that's changing. It still is, but it's changing. Um, but I, I can never, I can just can't get my head. I don't know. Is it an American thing that we just like every we wanted to know everything? The, okay, there's something to that, right? Now I've listened to uh, Father uh, Ripperger, um, Adam Blyes talked about this in relation to exorcisms. Curiosity kills the cat, mm. and when folks get too curious and they want to start questioning demons, poof, it's over. You've opened wide you know, the door to, uh, for the devil and the diabolic to come in and possess you, harass you, or, or, or whatever. So you, you really can't go into an exorcism with curiosity. It's, it's legal. There's no exorcism tourism. Exactly. So there, you have to ex- exercise great caution because, you know, your curiosity, you're not entitled to know everything there is to know. So there's, there is something to that. But when it, like public scandal, though, deserves, the public deserves to know the result of that public scandal. Like we, we're never going to know the full details of the McCarrick scandal because he's been laicized and he's about to pass himself if he hasn't already done so because we haven't heard a word from, from that camp in a long time. So there's a lot of this, a lot of these cases where they were public, huge public scandals and we're never going to hear another word about them. Yeah. You know, it just, and at the same time, we've, the, the public has lost even more confidence in holding Mother Church because of these scandals. How many people have left the body of Christ because of these scandals? So it seems to me, like when you're weighing the lesser of two evils, that you would say, no, we need to deal with this darkness up front in the public. I guess the challenge then is, how can you guarantee that the person you are judging legitimately, you know, committed these crimes or whatever? You know what I mean? I guess there's, there is some... There's an element like if you get it wrong, you have publicly calumniated this person. You have publicly uh, stolen their reputation. So I guess I don't know. I, I'm glad I'm not the judge of all this. I guess is the bottom line as I think about it out loud. But but I was always struggle struggle with that because he said to a reporter in 2014, "My authority stops at the door. They don't listen to me on the other side of that threshold." Except it doesn't. I'm like, you're the pope. Yeah. Just command it. And if they don't listen, tell the whole world that I, I command that this person do this. And if they don't, they are fired. I, I you know, you know, you're the Pope. I think I think that started when Paul VI laid down the 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 uh, the pontifical tiara. Mm, it was like yeah. the symbolic destruction of the the authority of the Pope. Yeah, he basically set it down and he said no. I, I, I'm not going to control the church the way that it's always been. I'm going to put this down, and put Concilium. it away. And uh, well, it just and tells you yeah. the, the nature of how the, you know, leading up to the Vatican, uh, Vatican II, the church was not in a good way. No, you know, and he's just a shining example of how how off things were. Hey, I just look at. I mean, it, you know, it's it's really easy to just say, well, you know, is the council the council? Well, look at look at the writings of uh, of uh, Saint Paul Pius X. Uh, when when you read uh, Pashendi, Pashendi, he talks about how uh, throughout time, and particularly in his pontificate, that you know, modernism. I think the quote says, it, it lifts up its ugly head in defiance. It, I mean, it was happening all the time, and maybe a little less obvious. Than it is now. Uh, I think it's more obvious now because of media. You know, we have people reporting on this, and there's yeah. there's a market for it. But it, it's not just the council. There was always there's always been an antichrist that has been working to subvert the church. Yeah, it was, 
who was it? I want it might have been Pius the Tenth, but I feel like we always attribute everything to Pius the Tenth when it comes to modernism. And I think it might have been talks so much about it. Yeah, but I think it might have been someone else. But Leo, they were praising. Maybe? maybe it was Leo, but they were praising. You know what? I think it might have been Leo because I think it was earlier, and they were praising the Pope for. Um, By the way, why having, isn't he a saint? Yeah, that's a good question. We asked that question um, last week. Yeah, uh, but the. Uh, so they, they, were, they were praising the Pope for destroying modernism. He was like, you have done it. You destroyed modernism. And the Pope responded, no, <laughs> I have suppressed modernism. And if a future Pope do, is not vigilant and does not keep suppressing it, it will rise up again. And sure enough, uh, with John the 23rd, with the, some mm. will say his optimism, um, with many people will not attribute uh, malice and say that it was... Just he was optimistic of the new world, optimistic of the world after World War II. And he uh, said, no, we don't need to listen to prophets of doom. We don't need to uh, be concerned about these things. We can open up the windows, let some fresh air in. And um, what <laughs> we did was... This is not the air you're looking for. Yeah. Then, <laughs> then, and, and then Paul VI says, the smoke of Satan entered the church. I wonder how it entered. Yeah. Maybe an open window? Yeah. I don't know. Maybe. Uh, Bandage 245 says, trouble is that there that it's easy to forget one thing that we had an unwritten code. Our word was our bond. We didn't have to make so many uh, so rules or expose everything because things got accepted now just weren't done. Uh, I think I kind of get what you mean there. Uh, he goes on to say you have to be old enough to remember that because it's not like it was covered publicly. It was just understood. Lots of bad happened, but bad but times were stricter not like now yeah um and honestly we ought to be able to trust holy mother church and the hierarchy to deal with these things properly but i think that scandal has gotten so bad now and there's so much corruption by the way there's there's sort of a, a conversation inside that article that i posted uh in the chat box you can see it there that um it talks about sort of uh, the three parts of the church, you know, the, the true church, the false church, the body of Christ. It's a very interesting article. You ought to check it out by, uh, who did I say it was? Marco Tosati. Yeah. But ultimately, you know, all these people calling for Benedict's canonization and to make him a doctor of the church. I Look, I will give this to him. His writing was... Very clear compared sure. to JP two. I really loved yeah, his three part series on the nativity. I thought it was excellent. I here's the thing, like what did Benedict say or do mm -hmm. that would make him a doctor of the church? Like just ignoring the the question of canonization, ignoring the question of like did he write clearly, did he do X, Y, or Z? It's like did he write things that were so counter revolutionary that and was so different, so unique, so necessary that it was, uh, it makes him a doctor of the church. Like that just doesn't make sense to me. Like he, at best, at best people are saying because of the clarity of his doctrine, but all he was doing in those cases was repeating what the church has always taught. Yeah. It's not like he was a St. Thomas or a St. Augustine or a St. Basil the Great. That was for, like, a deeper knowledge. Right. Of, of, of right. Yeah. Um, so that doesn't, it just doesn't make sense to me to, but I, I, it's just this after enthusiasm. having read JP two writing, but reading, <laughs> oh, man, reading <laughs> JP two's writings, I'm sorry. Oh, my oh, God. Man. I, cannot I get had to them. read love and responsibility. <laughs> I like took a, a JP two class. <laughs> I had to read love and responsibility like a dozen times oh, just to man. figure out. Like, what did he just say? And he still doesn't get it. <laughs> like, wow, well, I had to, like... You have to be Polish, no, man. man, it was yeah, rough. <laughs> yeah. It was so rough. So, p reading Benedict XVI, it was like, oh, wait, yeah. man, this is great. It's, like, <laughs> it just felt good you just to read it. <laughs> let's, you know? let's wait a hundred years, and then if people still think that Benedict's writings are the most relevant writings ever, um, then I say we can have a conversation. But until then canonizing people and making mm -hmm. them wanting declaring them like let's make them same thing with jp2 people were saying make them a doctor of the church let's wait a hundred years Sanco subido yeah, yeah they did that they uh, did that nine years after his death but Ooh, um making him a doctor of the church let's wait a hundred years and see are people yeah. still talking about like jp2's writings about how amazing they were and our yeah. the relevancy let's wait a hundred years yeah let's not let's not rush into things right
So yeah, anyway, very interesting. That's my take. My well, hot take of the day. Praise be to God. We're just about out of time. Um, on the show tomorrow, who is on the show tomorrow, Rudy? Oh, this great guest is going to be on tomorrow. Mm, really? You know, you're really going to oh. love the guest. It's going to be exciting. fantastic and oh, yeah. riveting. No kidding. Uh, really fulfilling conversation. Oh. It's going to edify you. I it's going to change your life. Okay. But I'm not going to tell you who it is. What? what? Because I want you to be surprised. I want you to be just delightfully oh, surprised as I to who's going to be on tomorrow. It's uh, so exciting. And, and it's just going to change your life. That's all I'm going to say. That's so, uh, I That's like how change your life. Wow. Uh, it's got to be Eduardo Verastegui. <laughs> it's got to be. Or no, it's going to be Michael Hitchborn. Years it's going to be David O'Grey. I don't know that it'll be it's any of those guys. It's going to be... Uh, I'm going to be honest with you. It's going to be the, our Marine friend. I'm like 99% it's going to be, sure it's going to be it Dr. Dr. Paul Kangor. It's going to be those guys. <laughs> yeah. But uh, I'm I definitely going to go say Eduardo Verasky tomorrow on the show, everybody. Let's go. Years ago, when I started Years acting, ago. I decided 2023 <laughs> was the best year to come on to Catholic Drive Time. Amen. About time. Going out with a band. God bless you. God love you. We'll see you then. Thank you for joining us on Your Catholic Drive Time. Jesus is a friend of mine. Jesus is my friend. Jesus is a friend of mine. I have to wait. It won't get done. What are we talking about? Come on, man. Go, Brandon. I agree. Yo, Angie.